Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Again, we have come together just to lift up the name of Jesus to get into the word of God on today. And so let us go to the throne. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. Yes. Yes. A day, Heavenly Father, that we have never, ever seen before and a day that we will never, ever see again once it is past. But, Father, you allowed us to rise this morning, and because of that, Lord God, we still have purpose, Lord God. And so, Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you will continue to reveal to us day by day, minute by minute, what our purpose is here in the earth Father, we know that when we accepted you as our Lord and Savior, we knew that our lives changed and it was no longer about us but about you. But even in us knowing that, Lord God, we need clarity and direction. So, Father, continue to lead us and to guide us. Father, we thank you for those that are in the house of the Lord on tonight, those that have pressed their way out. We are praying for those that are traveling on their way here. Allow us, Lord, just to be able to have a wonderful time in the Word of God. Father, I personally just thank you yes, Lord for God. being here tonight, Lord God, because, Father, you know the things that I was dealing with this week, and I know where I was supposed to be at this hour, but I'm here in the house of God. Father, I truly thank you, thank you, Lord God, for the power of prayer, Lord God. Father God, I thank you for just allowing us to collectively come together and have faith to believe yeah. despite what we knew and despite what we saw, Lord God, despite what I was feeling, Lord God. Father, I thank you. I thank, thank you, you for those that just prayed for me, Lord God. Father, I come right now in the name of Jesus, continuing to command that all blood clots will be ceased oh, in, the in the name, name of, of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Those things will not come anymore to be a distraction to what it is that you desire for me to do. And so, Father, I rejoice. Yes. You are so worthy, Lord God. There's so much work to do in the kingdom, Lord God. And, Father, I just want to be a vessel that's used by you. And so, Father, we're just asking that you just touch anybody that is tuning in tonight via live stream, Lord God, from the privacy of their home. Allow this word to penetrate them as if they were sitting right here in the sanctuary with us on tonight. Father, we thank you. And Father, if we went through this day without even taking an opportunity to acknowledge you and just to tell you that we love you, we want you to know right now, Lord God, that we truly love you. There is nobody like you, Lord God, and we are so thankful to be a part of your family. We went through this out this day, Lord God, and we may have done some things that wasn't pleasing in your sight. Father, I'm asking you right now to forgive us, Lord God, to forgive us from those sins that we've committed knowingly and unknowingly, Lord God. Allow your, 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 uh, uh, for, your forgiving power to just resonate on us right now, Lord God. And uh, we come against the enemy that will try to cause us to be in condemnation when we do something outside of the will of God. Yes, Father, it's not always our intent, but sometimes we miss the mark. But Father, we're just asking that you just cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so tonight, we're going to have us a conversation dealing with some things that we go through in life. And so I want to talk about trials and tribulations. Lord Jesus. Trials be a good and tribulations. Because guess what? They come. They come. And so before I get into the teaching, uh, let me, somebody just tell me what they just know off the break when it concerns trials and tribulations. What's the first thing that just comes to your mind when you hear trials and tribulations? Somebody, talk to me, anybody. Pass the microphone to Minister Folks. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. When I hear trials and tribulations, the first, the very first thing that comes to my mind is that scripture where Jesus said, there will be trials, of tri trials and tribulations but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So basically, it's like, it's coming, they're coming. You're going to get trials, you're going to get tribulations, but you got to remember, Jesus said, don't worry about it, he got your back. Amen. That's the first thing that really comes to my mind. Amen. What about you, Brother Yeah, What comes to your mind when you think about trials and tribulations? Uh, testimony. Testimony, yeah. elaborate. 
What you mean by that? Um, you go you go through things in life, and uh, as long as you know who's who has you, you know who's covered you, you come through it. Amen, amen. That's good. That's good. Come on, Mary. Tell me what comes to your mind when you think about trials and tribulations. Ooh, I'm getting murder on you, Bobby. No, I'm just. <laughs> about just the lesson learned and that God was so merciful that he let you come through it that he saw that you came through it and that he taught you while you were in it that's what I think about amen come on Angelita you might as well share something and then I'll move forward come on share something with us tonight when you think about trials and tribulations I think about how as <laughs> Christians we are always being watched and people want to, you have to show the love of Christ through trials and tribulations. So you, so people can't say, well, why should I serve a God like the one you serve when you tripping because this, that, and the third happens. So how you handle them, how you, you know, show people that God is real and that he got you. That's good. That's good. All of your answers were very, very good. Um, and when I think about trials and tribulations, uh, either, you know, if you haven't experienced any as of yet in your life, you will. Because they're coming and we're not exempt from them. And it's so key when you say it about how people watch us in the midst of our trials and tribulations. Because even when I think about the wonderful world of social media, people do not understand the power of social media and how it can affect those that follow you. And so... Sometimes as you're moving forward in life and God is trying to develop you and take you higher in him, there's some things that he's trying to burn off of you. And if you are a person in a position of leadership and influence, you need to be very mindful of how you even express your frustration. Because sometimes individuals can express their frustrations or things that really upset them, and it comes off in such a negative way that it's a turnoff. But yet you're minister this, deacon this, pastor this, bishop this, and your response is nasty. Because I've seen some individuals, because it's almost like in one breath, you blessing the Lord and you're praising God. And in the next breath, you going off on somebody. Oh, sometimes you may feel like giving a person a piece of your mind, but that ain't the place to do it. That's not the place to just air it out. Because how many of you know, a lot of times when people put stuff on social media, it's an indirect message. So you have an issue with a person, but you won't go directly to the person. So you just put an indirect message out there, and that is a major sign of immaturity as well. And so I saw something this weekend that just really, really grieved my spirit um, from somebody in ministry, you know. And the sad part is sometimes when you let it rip and you let somebody have it, it's almost like you gloat in it, like you really feel good about it when it is so out of tune. And so people do watch you when you go through different things. You could have had a bad day on your job. Hello. <laughs> but how you handle it is key. And yeah. so people often experience things in life that cause them to question God. To question God. Stuff happens. You have a whole bunch of people that have never even surrendered to God. But when you present God to them, they have a lot of questions about, well, if God was all this, then why does this happen? Because people see suffering. They see trials and tribulations, and they question God, the almighty God. And a lot of people won't be honest that are believers that have went through some stuff and they question God. And tribulations and trials that make you say, what's going on, God? What's up for real? Wow. 
right? Okay? Come on, pass it to minister, folks. I think uh, this was years ago. I, I was going through something, and I said, God, why me? And he said, why not you? Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that. It's like, we, we I mean, any, it, anyone can go through trials. Mm -hmm. I don't care what title you got on your, your, you know, whatever, you can go through it. That's right. It's like, why me? Why not you? Why not you? And so again, people often experience things in life that cause them to question God, especially when they go through trials and tribulations. See, I don't know too many people that question God when things are good. Oh, I know. Come on. I think about, well, you know, my, some things we remember. I remember when my brother, my brother died <laughs> in 1970-something. And I'll never forget his wife, who was Japanese, who was Japanese, and she said, if there is a God, why did he take my bill? Hmm. Because something tragic took place. Somebody that she depended on was removed from her, not even realizing that for the most part, we all going about here one way or another. Some of us pass sooner than others. Some of us die of natural causes. Some of us don't. We don't know why certain things happen to certain individuals. Come on. And then I have enough. A sister has said, if there, if there is a God, why is there so much bad things going on in the world? But you know the thing about it is when you, when you hear people asking questions of that nature, it's like they don't really know God. Mm -hmm. They don't really understand God. And they don't know that Satan is real. Hello. And that Satan's job is to go to and fro on this earth trying to devour who he can. He has the right. responsibility. And they just don't know. Yes. Yes. Just don't know. And that's the reality. There's a real devil. Yeah. People don't understand that. Some of the things that actually take place are a result of the enemy who's actually real. Mm -hmm. And so some of the stuff that you see without a shadow of a doubt is because there's a real devil. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and so we go through different things and we often question God when we go through trials and tribulations. And y'all will not sit on the back row. You might as well come on up to the front. We small in number, but let's do it. Amen. And so you can keep going. Go ahead. And so uh, as I said, you know, we're dealing with trials and tribulations on tonight. I said that, you know, a lot of times when we go through trials and tribulations, we have a tendency to question God. So, especially when you've been trying to live holy. Come on now. Yeah. Now, if you know you've been trying to live holy for God, you have been, you know, in your mind, okay, I've been faithful, I've been praying, I've been going to church, I've been sowing my tithes, I've been serving in the ministry, I've been doing all this. I've been sold out to you, God. And so it's hard sometimes when you know you've been going, when you've been serving God faithfully, and then everything underneath the sun seems to break out. If it ain't one thing, it's another. And so you may have those, can we talk God moments? <laughs> All right, God, we need to have a conversation because I'm not understanding right now why I'm going through all of this. I, 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 I changed my own ways. Now I'm sold out to you and all of this, what's really going on? So certain things will begin to bombard your mind, questions and things of that nature. But can I tell y'all what really baffles me? <laughs> what baffles me is when you have compromising carnal saints that be tripping when stuff happens in their life. When stuff be going on in their life. They, they tripping. They ain't trying to live for God. They ain't living holy. They doing everything that they want to do except serving God. And then when everything falls apart in their life, they got the nerve to be trying to trip. I don't know why I'm going through all this. Hello? No, no, no. 90% or 99% of the time, the issues in their life are a de direct result of their what? Choices. Choices. Too many people want to have their cake and eat it too. Hello? They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to walk in direct, blatant disobedience to God, but they want to be blessed in the midst of their mess. Okay? God don't bless no mess. The devil has lied to you. 
making you think that God is going to bless you in the midst of your mess. You don't want to live for him. You don't want to serve him. But you want all his blessings to be bestowed upon you. Come on now. Sorry. There's some principles in the word of God that are not going to change just because you want to do what you want to do. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 7 through 9. And I'm reading this from the New King James Version. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9 in the New King James Version of the Bible. And I'm going to ask Deacon James to read that for us on tonight. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. And as I said, there are principles in the Word of God that uh, uh, won't change simply because you want to do what you want to do. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. Pull out your Bible, pull out your iPad, your phone. Do what you got to do to get there. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh, to his flesh, will also will, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while we're doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Stop right there. I like that same passage in the New Living Translation, and I'll read that for you. It says, do not be misled. Come on now, don't be misled. You can't mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. Let me tell you, sometimes the enemy will try to make you think, what's the use of continuing to do good? Sometimes if you don't see the fruit of your obedience immediately. You, you feel like, why do, I wanna, why do I need to keep doing this? Ain't nothing changing. No, no, no. Trust me, there's some things that's taking place because it's all about reaping a harvest of what's being sown. And if you know anything about planting, you can put a seed in the ground today. That doesn't mean it's coming up in the next hour. Right. It doesn't mean it's coming up in the next week. Some things take a while before you actually see a blade above the ground. But guess what? Once it's planted in the ground and it's planted in good ground, there is something that's going on beneath the surface that you can't even see. So we as believers have to be patient in our doing good despite what may take place in our life. Because eventually you will reap a harvest because the word of God does not lie. You reap what you sow. So if you're sowing good seeds, then you're going to reap a good harvest. But if you're sowing bad seeds, you're going to reap a bad harvest because you're going to produce fruit of one kind or another. So sometimes in this day and age when everybody doing their own thing contrary to God and some, the enemy will try to make you think, why well, I need to keep pushing. Be encouraged by the word of God that tells you, do not get tired of doing what is good. Do not get tired of doing what is good. It will have its benefits. And so sold out soldiers in the kingdom of God don't give up when they're going through. We talking about trials and tribulations. No stuff going to come your way. But when you sold out, you ain't going to give up in the midst of you going through. Your obedience despite of is worth it in the long run. And so salvation, I said, it is a wonderful thing. It is the best decision that any of us can make. For those of us that are visiting, guess what? We talking here. 
So y'all can ask questions, interact, things of that nature. Feel free to stop me. Amen. And so salvation is wonderful, but it does not exempt any of us from trials and tribulations or temptations. Amen. And so let's talk about a trial. A trial is a temptation or adversity, the enduring of which proves the merit of an individual's faith. Can I say that again? Because I want somebody to break that down to me in a language that they can understand in layman's term. Let me say it again. A temptation or adversity. That's what a trial is. A temptation or adversity. The enduring of which proves the merit of an individual's faith. What does that mean? Anybody know? Answer the D. Go through something. It's basically show you what you're working with. Show you what you're working with. <laughs> It'll show you what you're working with. And let me tell you, we human, we go through different things, but we can't stay stuck. See, I'm not a person that go through a whole lot, right? Don't express a whole lot of things, but I honestly, the other night, when I was dealing with this whole thought of the blood clot and all this other stuff, Oh, a sister broke down. <laughs> and I'm just being straight up. And so the night that I broke down, my husband, he just looking at me, you know, trying to comfort me. And he was like, you know, baby, just, just calm down, relax. And, you know, he was very comforting on that night. Then the next day, we had the kids talk about, Let, let's talk about this. Because <laughs> all that right there <laughs> that you was doing, he was like, it's like you was just losing. I, I ain't used to you operating like that. Operating like that. So let me tell you something. I had a moment, but I'm going to come back. I, I, I bounce back. Because I know who I'm trusting and believing in. But how many of y'all know, sometimes you go through stuff, yeah. you have a moment because you're human. So I had my moment, but his thing is, come on, baby, but you know, you, who you believing in? What you trying, you know, he trying to say, basically he trying to say, a trial and tribulation is going to show you what you're really working with. What's up with you? Because you was lunching the other night. <laughs> that's, that's what he was saying to me in a nutshell, y'all. But guess what? I had my moment, got it together. That's the folks. One thing, I, I think about uh, Pastor Weather back in the 80s. He was in Bible study. And he said, I don't want y'all to get upset. Go home when y'all realize that I am human. Right. Pastor Mitchell is real human. <laughs> and y'all will see her when she be tripping. <laughs> I know Jack, yes. But my God. She was like a whole different person today, don't she? She was tripping. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> don't be laughing, quit talking. Don't be laughing. <laughs> And then the leg was hurting. <laughs> I want you to pray for me. <laughs> she asked me to pray. She said, she asked. <laughs> they was messing. I asked her to pray. She talking about, I ain't got much prayer for me because I'm tired. <laughs> That's what my mother said. I, I'm just tired. Okay, so you ain't gonna get much. I said, you know what? Forget it. Then I said, nah. <laughs> I said, you know, she was like, James can pray. I said, well, what, what, what for y'all pray? Jay, so they were trying to eat. He's a mom. He's a mom. He's a mom. She's a mom. Well, I got to go. He was eating. She said, well, with we, y'all, we, we. <laughs> you can pray <laughs> after Dick eat. And I was going to his plate like, it's going to be a minute. <laughs> I, I, said, said, kind of, it. I said, forget it. I don't even need y'all to pray. I'm fine. I'm fat. I, you know, I went to you know, the word of God say, lay, you lay hands on yourself. <laughs> and let me tell you, the reality, but I don't care who you are, how strong you are, you all need somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You need somebody. Look, really, the first person I put on blast to pray was you. Nobody else knew what I was going through but you. And we was having a conversation. And, and after that, then I shared what my concern was. But you was really the first person that I said pray for me about this. And well, so, I think, come on. <laughs> I went on and prayed. I laid hands on. Are you serious? Are you serious? 
That's what he said. Oh, I didn't know that. Why are you trying to make hands and prayed and I just prayed and everything on the leg. She was still tripping. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, oh I, had just held, and I had held it in all day, you know, working, running around, taking care of Jasmine and the baby. But yet these last couple of days, I've been feeling it, and it's like, it just, you know, ain't nothing like a good cry. And then the text messages start coming. <laughs> <laughs> last night, you know, first text messages. Can we just all get together and pray? And I looked at that one. And then here come another one. Can we all get together and pray? I'm like, I'm going to bed because I already prayed. And I'm, I'm standing with my prayers. I don't need to pray no more. But all I can say in the midst of it all, I woke up this morning feeling totally, totally changed, free from everything that I was experiencing. And so when it comes down to it, yes, what you go through, it will really show you where you really are when you're going through different things. Amen. The enduring of which proves the merit of an individual's faith. Going through trials and tribulations really reveal where you are for real. Oh, it reveals where you are in your life for real. It reveals how much faith you really have. Because y'all know we can talk a good game. But do you believe what you say? <laughs> do you believe that with God all things is possible? Do you really believe that Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides? Do you really believe that when you ain't got no food in your cabinet? <laughs> do you really believe it? Because it's easy to say it when you got food. Because you don't really have to believe in it. It's easy to believe and say Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. But when you need healing, do we believe it? Come on, Deanna. You believe it, but you want to take control of it. Right, there you go. You want to be in control. That's good. You want to take control of it. You want to work things out. And that ain't trusting God. We got to get to a point where we really trust God. And so a uh, trial will really reveal how much faith you really have in God. You don't know how devoted are you are to God until you are tested. You don't know. For real. You don't know. Let me tell you something. As a pastor, I preach the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. How many of y'all know there are times where God will test me with his own word? Oh, okay. You want to come into church and tell everybody, I will bless the Lord at all times that his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And you tell the people, you got to know how to praise him when God is good. When things are good, you got to know how to praise him when things ain't so good. How many of you know he'll test you? Yeah. Okay, that's what you tell everybody else. Can you walk in it yourself? You can tell people to still be faithful. And so they're 10%. No matter what, believing that God will provide. But as soon as you get your check and it's gone before you even write the first bill, can you still trust him to get that 10%? Because he will test you. See, when you got extra, <laughs> when you got what you call extra money, oh, it ain't that hard to give. Oh, let things be tight. That's where we want to start. <laughs> hey, look, Diallo, that's where we want to start taking control and doing things our way. That's right. Get another job. Get another job. So you don't know how devoted you are to God until you are tested. You got to ask yourself, will you trust and obey him even when you don't understand? You see, that's the thing. <clears throat> when you don't understand why stuff happening in your life, will you still trust? And obey him. Think about Abraham. Abraham was told to leave his father country. He didn't understand why. He didn't understand every single detail. But how many of y'all know he obeyed because he had to have faith in the one that sent him. And so the Bible tells us that we should rejoice at their occurrence. Talking about trials. Turn to James, a very familiar passage of scripture. James chapter 1. And we're going to look at Old Faithful verses 2 through 4. And I need somebody to read that for me on tonight. James, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. And when trials come our way, that temptation or adversity, when it comes our way, the Bible tells us that we should rejoice. Come on, James chapter 1. 
verse 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Stop right there. Count it all joy. That don't mean you won't go through. That don't mean you won't deal with a real emotion because emotions are real. We just got to get to a point where we don't let, allow our emotions to dictate and control everything we do and get us all out of whack. Count it all joy don't mean that you just found out a trying situation. Somebody just shot up somebody that you love, their life lost, and you're like, hallelujah, thank you. That's not what it's saying. It's really about resting and trusting in God in the midst of it all. Come on. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let me read that same passage for you in the New Living Translation. And it says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so there is something that we actually gain when we go through trials. There's a purpose. There's a reason, even when you don't understand it. Let's talk about tribulation. Because you hear the two terms used interchangeably. What is a tribulation? A tribulation is a great adversity. And anguish. It is intense oppression or persecution. It is a cause of great trouble or suffering. I said on Sunday, I don't mind suffering for righteousness sake. It's something else when you have to suffer because of disobedience. There is a difference. And so when I think about great suffering, that a righteous man endured. I think about Jesus Christ. And I also think about Job. When you think about it, God is omnipotent, people of God. He's omnipresent. Let me say that. He's omnipresent. And that means he has the ability to be everywhere at all times. God is also omniscient. Meaning he has superior knowledge and wisdom. And he knows everything, all things. There's nothing that takes place on this earth or in your life that God is unaware of. And so with that being said, turn your Bibles to Job chapter 1. Because with that being said, there is absolutely, again, nothing that takes place in this world or in your life that God is unaware of. Even the tribulations and trials in your life. We're going to look at Job chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 13. God really had me in this book today. And we're going to walk through it together, certain parts, parts of it. And so, Job chapter 1. No, actually it started verse 6. Amen. Job chapter 1 verse 6. And the subtitle of my Bible says, Satan attacks Job's character. Now, keep in mind, he's omnipresent, God, and he's omniscient. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who? Satan, Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth. And from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, hmm, Have you considered my servant Job? Somebody said, God, what are you doing? Why are you setting, why are you setting Job up like that? It's not like, come on now, a lot of times people have read this and they've been under the impression that Satan came and asked to mess with Job. Satan came in the presence of God, but guess what? The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? 
that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So, you know, Satan probably will come and have a conversation with the Lord and say, look, who can I try next? So being as though he probably, this is my own thinking, y'all, being as though this was probably something regular that he did, because there's nothing that takes place without God knowing. This was to his presence in the time in the presence of the Lord. So God already knew you're trying to find who you can mess with next. Have you considered Job? And so verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, hmm, does Job fear God for nothing? Well, there's a reason why he has so much respect for you. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge of protection around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You, 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 you cover him in every area. Of course, he's going to have such a great respect for you. And he goes on to say, you have blessed the work of his hand, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he would surely curse you to your face. He said, you done blessed Job so much. Job got a lot of respect for you because all the stuff you've done for Job. He said, he ain't lacking nothing. He said, but guess what? I promise you, if you mess with his stuff, oh, he going to curse you. And so verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Guess what? It's time for him to get busy. All right? You think your boy Job going to really just hold out in the midst of all that you allowing me to get ready to unleash on him? Or you going to see he going to curse you. So he leaves the present, and now it's time to wreak havoc. And so Job experienced enough in a short time. Come on, y'all. I ain't talking about over a matter of days. I'm not talking about he experienced so much in one day that the average person would have lost their everlasting mind. And so Job experienced enough in a short time to almost cause anyone to lose their mind and question God. In the midst of all that took place. And guess what? This was just the beginning of things to come. Oh, we talk about if it ain't one thing, it's another. But this was just the beginning of what was to come, the things that we're going to look at in this next passage of Scripture. And so the book of Job, if you go through the book of Job, it reveals more than what we are about to examine right here in Job chapter 1, verse 13 is where we're going to start. So Satan the left, he the left out the presence. God said, you can do everything you want to him, all this stuff, because you think he caught up and into me because of the stuff. Mess with it all, but don't touch him. Verse 13, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's home. They was just hanging out together, the siblings, right? And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. How many of y'all know that's where they made a lot of their money out of their oxen and things of that nature, their livestock, that was their money. And so the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So in the midst of it, you got this person that is witnessing the servants being killed, witnessing the animals and stuff being taken away, killed. And so guess what? Here it is. This one person said, but I alone escaped to tell you. While that individual was still speaking, while that individual was telling Job what just happened while his kids was gathered together in their home, what happened to his livestock and things, while he was still speaking, another also came. Can you imagine it? Job, Job, somebody running up. Okay, he first got this message right here. And then somebody else running up to him. And it says, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone escaped to tell you. And guess what? While that individual was still speaking, Another also came and said, 
The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Come on, y'all, it ain't stopped yet. While he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons, now you done already took out my servants. You done already took out my livestock, my livelihood. You done messed with my money. Hello? Now somebody's coming to tell me about my flesh and blood. It goes on to say your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness. Ain't nothing like but a tornado, right? Tornado, a great hurricane. A great wind came across from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people. And they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Y'all, all of that was in one day. Back to back. It's one thing when you lose one person that you love. It's another thing. It's one thing. It's hard to lose one child. But can you imagine all of your children dying at the same time, at the same moment? He went through a lot. Satan had permission from God. To allow all of this to take place. What's amazing is the next verse, verse 20. After getting all the bad news, it says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked. I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. We started out talking about different scenarios and how one young lady said, if there was really a God, why did he even take my husband? We have a tendency to question God when things going on. But Job went through all of this. None of us, none of us can even compare our situations to Job. Can I just be for real? I mean, if your stuff is worse than Job, then let's, let's have a conversation. But this is a lot of stuff that he actually endured. But he did not sin and he did not charge God with the wrong. Pass the microphone. He fell down and worshiped God. Some people will fall down and curse God. They wouldn't be worshiping him if this happened to them. Come on. Excuse me. When you, I mean, when you think about Job, and if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard this, um, you heard what happened, what took place mm -hmm. in Job's life. I mean, this, Put your finger down, girl. No. This whole chapter... <laughs> Um, goes on and on about what uh, what Job, uh, what happened to Job, and how his wife you know, said he may have done something, and then you know he, you know he continued to you know to praise God. But I, what are we supposed to learn from this? Oh, we, we don't because know. no one, I don't think I know, I don't know anyone personally that had gone through what Job has gone through. So there's a there's something that we supposed to learn from what Job experienced. There's a lot that we're supposed to learn. There's a lot that you learn from Job and his experience. First of all, it solidifies to every person that wants to question what goes on in their life. There's a real God and there's a real devil. But it solidifies and lets you know there's nothing that takes place in your life that God isn't aware of. Even though the enemy may have been given permission because God trusts you. See, that's the key thing. God trusted Job. He said, yeah, in the midst of you attacking him, oh, that's my boy. He's going to still remain faithful and serve me. It shows you 
that no matter what goes on in your life, you should never curse God for what is taking place. It shows you that even though it may be hard to wrap your mind around it, sometimes when you're going through and you just worship, it changes your whole atmosphere. There's power in worship. So he could have lost his mind, but he tapped into God and began to worship. Come on, Mary. I'm reading chapter, I mean, verse 16 again. And I'm just kind of, uh, God, well, I just need some explanation. It says, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to get this right in my mind. It said the fire of God. So was he was just exaggerating this person, exaggerating because God didn't do anything. He let he gave Satan the permission to do it, right? So it couldn't have been mm -hmm. the fire from God, of God. Mm -hmm. He's giving it an explanation based on what he's actually seeing take okay. place. At the end of the day, the servants and the animals have been killed. And so sometimes when you see stuff taking place, you want to explain it. Like, like, you know, like I just said in the midst of this, it was like a tornado. See, because the winds came and the four corners of the house fell on them. So the guy is explaining what he saw happen. I used the term tornado. He see the fire of God. It could have been, you know, could have been lightning, whatever it could have been. But at the end of the day, nothing was taking place that God had not allowed to take place. Okay? And so, when we look at chapter 1, verse 13 through 22, in these particular passages, as you saw in the beginning, Satan had permission to touch everything except for Job. He could mess with everything except for Job. He attacked his family and those around him. That's amazing to me because sometimes people in your circle may be attacked because of you. It was something that God was dealing with Job with, with the enemy. But his loved ones around him, his servants, his livestock, they ain't do nothing. They did absolutely nothing. Because everything that was taking place was directly connected to Job. That's deep to me. And so, Attacking his family didn't cause Job to come out of character. He didn't curse God. He still worshiped God. And so guess what? How many of y'all know the enemy had to turn up the heat? Because yeah. at first he said, oh, I promise you, he's going to curse you once you mess with all his stuff. All the stuff that's been keeping him, all his money, everything that he had. Oh, yeah, he's going to curse you. And when it ain't happen, oh, the enemy said, oh, nah, we need to have another conversation. Because what he thought was going to work didn't work. And so, let us look at chapter 2. Because in the first part, he could touch everything around him except for him. How many of y'all know he's now getting ready to attack his health? His health. Sometimes the attacks that come on you ain't nothing but the enemy. And so he could attack his health, but he couldn't kill him. Let us look at Job chapter 2, verse 1. 
Again, there was a day when the sons of God, this is a totally different day. All of this to happen, now there's another day when they're coming in the presence of God. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where, and the amazing part is most people that read and talk about Job, they talk about what happened in the first chapter. That's usually all that you really hear at the end of the chapter. But see, the first chapter was phase one. Now we're in phase two. And so the Lord, in verse two, it said, the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Again, it's like, come on, God, what are you really doing? Then I say sometimes when you're going through stuff, you, you question God. And so us being outside of looking in, it's like, come on, God, what are you really doing? You know, you know, you know, let them experience all of this. Now you're going to present something else. And so Satan answered the Lord and said from walking to and fro, verse 3, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on earth? Come on now. Don't you want God to look at you the way he looked at Job? Don't you want God to be able to look at you and say, that's my boy right there. I know him. I know her. I know what's inside of them. So despite what you try to bring their way, I know what they're going to do in the long run. Oh, it may get rough, but I know them. They are faithful. They're committed. They're soldiers in the army of the Lord. You can put the press on them all day long. They may bend, but they won't break. They may shed a tear, but they'll dry them off and keep on moving. You want God to be able to look at you like that. And so when I think about that, I'm like, man. He said, my servant Job, there is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man. One who fears God and shuns evil. He ain't straddling the fence. One foot in the world and one foot in God. He's a righteous man, a man that shuns evil. And he still holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, okay, skin for skin. Let's do this. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Oh, yeah. Afflict him, God. Afflict him, God. And I promise you, he's going to turn on you. Come on, minister folks. Because guess what? Going back to Mary's thing, Satan don't control the air. He don't control the storms. He don't control the lightning. He had a conversation with God. But God said, okay, I'm going to allow some stuff to happen, but I'm going to show you the long run. So at the end of the day, the fire that failed, God only got control over the elements of the earth. Come on. You know, as we're reading, Joe, I'm thinking about that. There's a saying in um, Krishna Dom. Mm hmm. <laughs> that um, I don't put no more on you than what you can handle. And I'm thinking that's coming from Job. You come from Job and from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 10, verse 13. The people say it about temptation. No temptation is overcome you such as common to man, but with that temptation you'll provide a way of escape. But if you think about it, God don't put no more on you than what you can handle. It's like this was a lot for Job, and Job handled it. So we so I guess you know, I'm thinking, you know, whatever you may be going through, whatever trial or tribulation that you may be going through, God knows that you can handle it. Yes. But you don't know you can. Hello. <laughs> That's why you need to be tripping. <laughs> That's right. God know you can handle it, but you don't know that you can. That's why you be feeling like, I'm going to lose my everlasting mind, but you don't. You may feel like that, but you don't. And so, verse 5, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, 
Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. You can't kill him. You can do what you want to do, but don't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Come on now. Y'all can imagine one boil can cause you a lot of pain. Especially when you're trying to get it to a point where it's dead, you're trying to get it to a head, to go away, different things. That can be very painful. But he was struck over his entire body from the foot, from his sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot's herd which, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the middle of ashes. Just trying to bring some type of soothing feeling to the boils that's all over his body. Then his wife said to him, now the wife, she ain't get taken away with everybody else. His wife said to him, Joe, now come on. We done lost all our children. We ain't got no money. We broke, busted, and disgusted. We don't have any more animals to even make no money. And you still want to serve God? His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. His wife had enough. She didn't want to hear nothing about God. She wasn't trying to worship God. She was in the midst of her pain and her emotions. The lavish lifestyle that she was used to living had to change. I mean, come on now. You can go from being able to eat filet mignon steak, but then your finances change and your hot dogs and beans is your meal. Yeah. It's a major adjustment. But how many of you know, you still will learn how to survive. It may not be like it used to be, but you will still know how to survive. But sometimes when you have become accustomed to a certain lifestyle, you know, you got millionaires that couldn't imagine living like I live. They would just think, I'm a peasant. And so, she said, curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? He said, come on now. Oh, you want to praise God when everything is going well. But now that we're going through some stuff, now you'll praise God, now you'll worship God. He said, basically, you got to have a balance with this thing. Because guess what? Stuff happened in life. It ain't going to be peaches and cream all the time. But she was used to living a good life all the time. He said, shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Joe did not sin with his lips. Come on. Give it a mic. Could it have been that the wife and then let's talk about the three friends were being used by the enemy? I wouldn't say that they was necessarily being used by the enemy. She probably just wasn't in the same spiritual state of maturity like Joe. An uh, immature Christian will respond a little different in situations than a mature person. Amen. We got a question. Okay. Uh, what would a question be, coming in from Periscope. Yes. What would be considered as cursing God? Is it doubting or becoming bitter or to stop having faith? Stop having faith would be a form of cursing God because now you're no longer believing in your heavenly father. Blaming him in a in a way as if as, as in a way as if he's wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, like I said, are you still gonna have faith and obey God when you don't understand? You're not gonna always understand. You're not gonna always be in agreement with things with things that God do, but you still gotta trust that Father knows best. So when you get to the point. When you get some people that no longer want to have anything to do with God anymore. I know a brother 
that went through some major trials and tribulations. This dude was on fire for God, making records for God, doing great street ministry and some for God. And got to a place where he experienced a trial and tribulation because of some other people that tried to take his life. He didn't want to have nothing to do with no Christians. He even got to the point he said, I'm not even considering myself to be a Christian anymore. He got to the point he was totally against God. But me and my husband rejoice now. Because he's somebody I will always reach out to from time to time. My husband was led to reach out to him. And eventually, one time he looked at something of mine on YouTube and he said, this is the first Christian video he's watched in a long time. He's out in the desert having a moment with God right now. But God is changing his heart. Amen. But the trials and tribulations he went through got him to a point where he wanted to curse God and want to have to have nothing to do with God, wasn't trusting God, wasn't believing God. He was angry and let the world know it. And I would see his post and I would pray and I would intercede. God, touch him because I know how mightily you used your son in the kingdom of God. But the devil has gotten him to a point where he's not embracing the trial and tribulation like the word of God says. See, again, we can say, count it all joy. But when the rubber meets the road, where you at for real? So cursing God can come in many different forms. Some people can say some words to him that are very, very not nice. Some individuals can get to a point they form a curse in God and choose to no longer talk about him, acknowledge him, and all of that. So it's many different things. And so, in seeing what Job went through, please remember that he was human. He wasn't Superman. He was human. And he had some moments of frustration when you continue to read through the book of Job. He had moments of frustration. He had questions. See, it's nothing wrong with asking God questions. Just don't get to a point where you're just outright in a nasty way blaming him and coming at him with all kind of attitude. But Job had some questions as time went on. How many of y'all know Job had a moment of depression? Because he was human. Because Job got to the point, he said, I cursed the day that I was ever born. Because he was really feeling all that he experienced. He was grieving. All his children was gone. All his livestock was gone. His money, everything was gone. Now the woman who's supposed to be his help me is tripping. It's almost like all I got is you and you can't even stand with me in the midst of this. Oh, he was going through. So he had some real moments of frustration. To the point that he cursed the day that he was born, but never God. In the midst of his moments came reality checks. Because, you know, just like I said, I boohooed the other night. Okay? And you may have your moments when you boohoo, but you better have a reality check. You may get like the prophet and sit, sit under the tree and trip for a moment. But then sooner or later, God will come to you and say, what are you doing here? You don't need to be right here. I ain't calling you to be in this place. He wasn't talking about no physical place. Why are you still in this place tripping? Knowing I use you mightily to destroy the prophets of Baal. Now you're running from Jezebel, sitting under this joint, tripping. Don't want to eat. Don't want to do nothing for you. All you want to do is sleep. What are you doing here? Lord, ask that. <laughs> so, um, why was you tripping? <laughs> Didn't you just tell the people that I'm human? Right, but <laughs> well, I mean, really, what, what was going on? Because <laughs> no, I'm because I'm, I'm looking at it, and I know what you went through before. So, what you thought you wasn't healed, or what was you? Well, it's not a thing of not thinking that I wasn't healed from the first time. Because when you have blood clots, it is said that you will, a lot of times you'll get them again. 
So it's something that you have to be mindful of. So because I've had the first blood clot, and that leg is always more sensitive ever since then. And when I think about it, it'll get to it unless I get to the end of Job. But the reality, why was I tripping? Sometimes you think about what something could be, but that's when you have to shift your mind. See, because guess what? I ain't trying to go nowhere. What do you mean go somewhere? I ain't trying to go to glory, even though I know it to be so much better than being right here. I ain't ready. Because I know that they are just like Paul. Because guess what? No, just like Paul, you understand. Just like Paul. Paul said he was dealing with a real struggle. Because for real, he knew it was better to be in the presence of the Lord. But he also knew it was better that he remained. Because there were souls and people that still needed to be reached by him. See, my thing is, I know my work ain't over. I know there's souls that God still had for me to reach. I want to still see people get set free. It wasn't nothing about me. I want to be here for others. Right, and I think, and, 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 and when I was praying for you, I don't know if you, you know, sometimes somebody prays so you don't hear everything that they're saying. But you got a revelation. Go ahead, go ahead, well, go ahead. I, I saw that as a distraction to what's getting ready to take place. Mm -hmm. And that was just a way of the enemy trying to get you off a track of what God wants you to do. So yeah. you you actually focus, you, you took your focus off of what you supposed to be doing and what God has called you to do and what's getting ready to take place this weekend. Yeah. You, you focus on the leg. Yeah. Yeah, she came out, but I'm saying that. I had my moment, but I came out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right, yes. but that's 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 how you know when when God got something for you to do, you got purpose. Uh huh. You have purpose, but it's just amazing how you, the, he can just, the enemy can just snatch you for a minute. He get your mind. Mm -hmm. He can snatch you for a minute, and then you forget all. You know, you be so caught up on you know this this happening or why is this going on, and forgetting the fact that your purpose. Of what you have to do is a, it's a distraction, just like when Nehemiah was on the wall. Yes, you know distractions. And distractions do come, and then right. we have a tendency to focus on those distractions mm -hmm. and get off of what we're going to have to do. And, 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 and yes, we can easily get distracted. But like I said, Job had his moments, but he had his reality checks as well. You can pass the microphone so back. To forty two chapters. <laughs> That's my, oh, you had it and then back to back. Go ahead. Thank you for that topic, Pastor. Um, and then I, you were saying what's happening this weekend. This weekend no, is the I, launch I, of the yeah, work in DC. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thought about I thought about that just when, after she said it. But I was thinking. I said, you know, while we was reading Job, it was like you know something had downloaded in my mind about you know the things that we go through and then the things after is what you need to focus on. It may not seem like it's a uh, it's a uh, like God is saying, okay, like say for instance, I went through things on my job and now I'm at a new job, but the, the things to do there is much different than what I had to do at my job because right now I'm in a place where there's so many souls that need to be saved. Mm -hmm. And if I had not, or if I had taken the job that, that was presented to me and it looked really, really good, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be at the place where I am right now to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking, that was presented to me after I already accepted the job, and it was like, wow, you're going to do what? Mm -hmm. And you're going to give me what? Mm -hmm. But if you don't focus on what God has for you and then go to Him before you make a decision, you'll make the wrong decision, and you'll miss God. Because every door ain't an open door. It ain't. Come on, pass it back. Trying to figure all that laughter that was going on. Y'all need to tune me in. <laughs> Come on. Um, I was just going back to when you were saying the thing about trials. And while I was sitting here, um, it just came to me that trials come to get you to reflect, learn, discern, and prepare. Yes. In a nutshell. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so... <laughs> You reflect on how you go through mm -hmm. and how you get to the place that you're going through. Mm -hmm. You learn from the information you discovered in your reflection. Mm -hmm. 
then you discern your season and status and your spiritual walk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you progress into your next with the knowledge you obtained from your test. Yes. So God's not going to keep having you going through the same test over and over again when he's trying to take you to somewhere else. But he's not going to take you backwards because once you already complete the test, you got to progress and move forward. Yes. Yes. Amen. All right now. All right now. And so, as I said, in the Mr. Job's uh, uh, moments, he had some reality checks, and that's why he would say, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. He also said in another verse, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You have to know in your spirit that despite what it looks like, in the end, you will be all right. When we go through, the Lord wants our character and integrity to remain in effect. Turn to Job 27. Job chapter 27. He wants our character and integrity to remain in effect. Let me tell you something. That's when the word of God got to come into play. Because you can give in to what you may be feeling. Job 27. You can give in to what you may be feeling or thinking and destroy your character and integrity. See, one thing about it, I know who I am no matter where I'm at. Nobody has to know that I'm a believer. Nobody has to know that I'm a pastor. Nobody has to know any of those things about me, but I know that about me. So even in situations, how many of y'all know when ain't nobody else around? Because, you know, sometimes the devil will tell you, you can go off on this person straight up. Won't, the won't nobody know? No, somebody wouldn't know. God will know and you will know. But you got to have that word inside of you when those things come. Because I'm telling you, last night, oh, I was furious. And one thing about it, everything that I used to know how to say, oh, it came to my head. Oh, I had to cast down and apply the word of God because some stuff was coming in my head because of frustration. Now, can you imagine if I allowed those things to come out of my mouth? How it would have just slaughtered my character and my integrity. The reality is I'm human. But you can't allow what you feel to control and dominate your actions. Because that doctor wouldn't have known what hit him up in that camp if I would have released everything that I was feeling and thinking in my mind. And so no matter what you're going through, you have to keep your integrity. It was so deep I had to repent for my thoughts, y'all. Them joints was popping in there left and right. That's why I say sometimes you got stuff that just come through your mind. You can't meditate on it. You got to cast it down. But I know it was coming from a place of rage and frustration. But no matter what you're going through, just like Job, you got to maintain your integrity. Job 27 verse 1, it says, Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter. Hey, he was going through. As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, my God, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. And will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Because at the end of the day, it's all about a choice. You got a purpose in your heart that no matter what comes my way, no matter what I deal with, I'm going to remain a woman of character or a man of character and integrity. The choice is yours. And so doing right despite of is a sign of spiritual maturity. See, when you're immature, you'll let it rip. Oh, years ago, I would have let it rip out of my mouth. 
But doing right, despite of, is a sign of spiritual maturity. And you all know we just did a seven-week teaching on spiritual growth and maturity. And so remember the word that says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. You may lose some stuff in your time of going through, but God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Last scripture, Job Chapter 42. And we're going to look at verse 10. That's where we're going to start. And we know that in the midst of it, Job had his friends that was coming to him saying all this stuff, trying to get, trying to figure out what's going on. Because let me tell you something. When you're going through some stuff, people trying to figure out well, what you do. What did you do? Why are you going through this? Everybody that's going through suffering, trials, and tribulations, it ain't because they have sinned. Some people are going through because of wrong choices, but some of us are not. But how many of you know you always have your naysayers? People that's looking at you, they're trying to figure out mm -hmm, why she going through all that. I wonder what she done did now. Because you know she always doing something. You know, even when you try to change, somebody try to hold you in bondage to your past. Right. Okay? <laughs> so, Job 42, as we wind down, verse 10, it says, And the Lord restored Job's losses. Everything that was taken away, Job, the Lord restored Job's losses when he did what? Prayed for his friends. Woo. How many of you know some of your stuff is tied up in you praying for others? And in you praying for others may involve you releasing them and forgiving them for some of the foolish things they may have said or done to you. Because his friends was talking out the side of their neck. But it wasn't until Job got his heart right towards them. Despite of that foolishness. Because guess what? Even when somebody else being ignorant and dumb, God don't want you to do tick for tack. It was not until Job prayed for his friends that he received or restored, God restored all of the losses. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Oh, you thought he was straight in the beginning. Oh, he really got it going on now. Then all his brothers and sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house and they consoled him and comforted him for all of the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. See, sometimes, because you hear it, they came to him. You don't hear about these individuals really coming to him in the midst of it. Because sometimes when you're going through, how many of y'all know people are back on? Right. Oh, they'll back away from you. Y'all, they'll tell you in a heartbeat, you know, if you need anything, I'm here for you. Then all of a sudden you're going through, you can't find them nowhere. And so the bottom line is, here it is. Job went through all that he went through. Things are changed, and thank God his heart was in the right place. Because now that they're coming around, he greeted them. But they came around and they consoled him because sometimes... Sometimes people back away and not in the negative sense all the time. They just don't know what to do. They don't know how to help you. Whew. They don't know how to help you. Because I know a woman that has been going through for years and I'm like, God, I wish I could do more than just pray for her. There's so much that I wish I could do for this woman. Because I don't even know how she's remained in her right state, state of mind. But it goes on to say, those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house and they consoled him. I see two things in there too. Because sometimes once you get back on your feet, then right, come the leeches. Right, 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 right. Okay? When you ain't had nothing, when everything was gone, when all your money was gone, when nobody there, they wouldn't try to hang out at your house no more. Because they was used to having the nice parties and the gatherings at your house. 
the steaks and all this. Now you 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 got beans, and that's it. Beans and biscuits. <laughs> and so now, now they ain't around. But now all of a sudden, you done got double. Here they are. Hey, Joe. Oh, you know I was praying for you. You know, I was in the scene and praying for you the whole time. I know it was rough. So it says, they came to him and ate food with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver. Oh, they ain't come empty handed. He had things going on. He was already blessed. But now they're coming with a piece of silver, so they ain't coming empty handed. Each a ring of gold. Verse 12, now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Yes, he lost all of his children, but he had some more. It'll never take the place. No one or nothing can take the place of a loved one that you have lost. But guess what? All of them was taken away. God gave them back some more. And a lot of times people often wonder about what happened to Job's wife. It don't necessarily say. But I don't think Job being an upright man got rid of his wife because she couldn't handle the adversity. He probably tried to strengthen her in the midst of it. And so guess what? As time went on, they probably came together and had some more kids. Yeah, you lost your kids. But we can still be fruitful and multiply. Because nothing says that he got rid of her. A good man ain't going to get rid of his woman when she's going through. When I trip, you better keep it together, buddy. <laughs> Don't be trying to toss me to the side because I have a moment. Anyway, it says, he had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemimiah, and the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen, Hapak. In all the land, there were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers, which was not common. But you got to understand, the women didn't receive the inheritance, just the brothers, but that's a whole other message. And this is the, the verse, this is the closing verse that gives me life. Because sometimes when the devil like to come with a distraction, try to make you think that you ain't going to be here. I could be preaching to myself tonight, y'all. Y'all just in my own, you know. I'm preaching to myself if you don't even realize that by now. Amen. See, what the devil will try to do is distract you and make you think that you will die and not live. But I shall live and not die. Amen. Amen. And so even when you think about all the stuff that Job went through, the different trials and tribulations, I love this part right here. It says, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his, his children and grandchildren for four generations. Mm -hmm. So Job died old and full of days. See, guess what? I want that to be my story. I want to see my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I want to see slews of people's lives changed and some. So I get excited. And I say I claim that for myself. I shall what live and not die. I may go through trials and tribulations, but them jokers will not take me out. And so when you embrace trials, Despite the fact that it can be challenging to remain godly and faithful, God will grant you the grace to endure. Your, your trial doesn't have to devastate you. Right. Trials are used to purify you. Like a refiner's fire, he will use a trial to rid you of everything in your life that should not be there. Oh, there's a purpose. There's a reason. He's trying to kill some stuff in you. Stuff that don't line up with you as a believer. Stuff that will hinder you from walking in your destiny. Come on, let's be for real. When things are good, we're not really in the face of God like we need to. Because everything all right. But how many of you know, soon as stuff fall apart, now you're in the face of God. So, we can't put God on the back burner when things are good in our life. And because we do that, sometimes the best way for him to get our attention is through difficulties and trials. Because when you was living life, when you thought was things was all good, when you was having your fun, but he wasn't in it, he said, okay, because you mind anyway, I don't already stamp you. 
The blood of Jesus is on you because you accepted Christ. But you think you want to do your own thing? Let me allow everything underneath the sun to start happening. Because I know I'm going to get your attention and you're like, God, Father, I need you right now, Lord, to make a way out of nowhere. Oh, you have conversation. When you was out there doing your thing, living good, you wasn't praying, fasting, churching, nothing. But he said, okay, I'll get your attention. So guess what? There's a reason for your trials and tribulations. He's trying to talk to you. God will also use trials to show you who he is. In the midst of them, he reveals his love, his power, wisdom, and character by helping you in times of need. He really does know how much suffering you can handle in your heart. Therefore, he is going to limit the trials that touch your life. He knows what you can handle for real. His goal is never to destroy you. Rather, he wants to build your character. And so there's a saying, and we've heard it before. With every new level comes a new what? Well, it's the same thing with your level of maturity and trials. Listen to what Charles Stanley said about trials. He said, if you were training, and we get right in, if you were in training to lift heavy weights, you wouldn't start by lifting a 200-pound barbell. Rather, you would begin exercising with five-pound weights. Then when you were able to handle the five-pound weights, you would progress to the 10 pound weights and so forth. In other words, you will progress in the intensity of your training. The same is true in your spiritual life. As you are able to handle more in faith, God will increase the weight of your burden to continue to stretch you. We can't never get comfortable with where we are. As we're constantly going from glory to glory, there's going to be different things that we're going to experience. He does this because he sees your potential and knows what he can do in your life. God isn't trying to break your spirit. He's teaching you to be submissive to him so that you can serve him with excellence and joy. So at the end of the day, we must choose how we respond to difficulty, hardship, and pain. Those trials and tribulations, they're going to come. But how are you going to respond? Will you be devastated by them? Or will you trust God? Will you cry and complain? Or will you thank God for what he is doing? Because you know he is building character in you. And even when you don't understand what is going on, and this is the last scripture, you don't even have to turn there. Even when you don't understand what's going on, please know this. Romans 8. Got to have my four clothes. Amen. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 28. No matter what you're going through, good, bad, and ugly, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. Even your trials and tribulations are working together for your good. God is trying to build character on the inside of you. And burn some stuff off of you that needs to go. Amen? Amen. Thank you all for allowing me to finish this teaching on tonight. I thought it was going to be a two-part teaching, but I actually completed it tonight, so I'm thankful. I thank everybody that has taken an opportunity to tune in via live stream, you stream, and those of you all that will watch the replay on YouTube. I pray that you are blessed by this teaching. Uh, you can always go to our website, www mbttministries.com to find out more about our services, our times, our location. We would love to have you to come and fellowship with us. If you're in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, come on out. Fellowship with us. Don't always watch us on Periscope or, or, or YouTube. Come 
and sit and sup with us in the house of the God, of house of God. We would love to have you. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your evening. Praise the Lord.